So how'd you go about making it feel so real? I mean, not even just like visually and, you know, with the work Rodrigo did, but like when you're sitting there writing the script, because there's, you know, a fine line with this type of thing. It can easily become like a gimmick. And, yeah, you sure. know, you go into your movie and it's over and then you leave. But how'd you make it feel so real? I think a lot, it, it, it has to do with kind of the, the route I decided to take it with more of a Hitchcockian thriller and a suspense thriller as opposed to, again, the reasoning behind it. I, we've seen we've seen enough, even Fogel's, which I thought was a great film, and that obviously wasn't a heart of thriller, but the person was doing it to teach him a lesson. And that's not a criticism of the film, it's just that you, I, I, in my opinion, do you believe that? Do you, maybe, and there are very well are people out there, I'm sure, that are crazy enough to do that. I'm gonna teach a complete stranger a lesson today by doing what happens in phone booth. Maybe, maybe. But there's still that question of, I don't know. I don't know if that's real or not. I think what makes Buried so um, so scary is the fact that it is based on real things. It's not based on a true story, but it's based on people really take, being taken hostage. Uh, and I think that, that realism is what creates real fear. So you finish the script now and you work with Rodrigo. Yeah. What was the collaboration like at that point? Did the two of you talk any moments out, change anything? You know, what ha it was great because he and I, it's fine, we kind of have this little saying where we're from different parts of the globe, but we have a similar view of the world somehow. It, it's, and it's the case because we would be Skyping and that's how we work because he was in Spain. He saw the film for what I'd written. If that makes any sense, he saw you know he saw the story. He didn't want to change it. He didn't want Paul to get out. He didn't want to cut away. He saw it exactly. And as far as rewrites, I did a polish on the script. You know, I ended up adding I think a total of about another eleven pages. And it, they were based on some notes that he had, notes that I had even after re after writing it and not looking at it for a while. And the great thing about Rodrigo was that he was always it was always. As the writer, he always said, okay, well, I want you to write it. We talked about something, and we agreed on something. I agreed on something, and they said, okay, now go write it. As opposed to him saying, well, thank you for your script. Now I'm going to go make it my own, and then go make my movie based on what I did to your script. He was so faithful to the script, and I'm so thankful. And the same with Ryan. Honestly, there's, I happen to be reading the script. Not to be, just keep talking, but I happened to read the script yesterday on the train ride up here. And I hadn't read it in so long. I just opened it up, and I'm scrolling through it, and I'm looking at... Not only the the the, the, the you know, I can't stutter the um, the action, but the dialogue and it's all spot on. You think it's weird because Ryan's so he's he's such a, a a natural actor that you think he's kind of just making it up as he goes along, and it's he's such a good actor that it's 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 not the case really. It's, it's right there on the page. Every like moment of hesitation, every stammer, every stutter, like I'm doing now, it's all there. I feel like it needs to all be choreographed, especially if he's doing the lighting as well. Yeah. I mean, every word, every movement, everything he grabs. So that was all included in the script from the start? Yeah, it, it's and, and that's in the second draft, that's, and I said revisions based on Rodrigo's notes, that's a lot of what entered into the second draft was that his kind of production notes of, you know, there should be moments of maybe the light goes out here and then goes back on and stuff like that. So the technical stuff entered there at that point. Uh, but, you know, it, it just, like I said, it just became me sitting there writing, thinking, what the hell would I do? And it wouldn't be easy. It, I mean, obviously it wouldn't be easy, but it wouldn't be like, this isn't a situation, we're not, this isn't Ryan the Green Lantern. This is Ryan Paul Conroy. This is Ryan, me, you, everyday person put in the situation. We're not the hero. We're not Uma Thurman. We're not going to punch through the top of the coffin and climb out. This is reality unfortunately for Paul Conroy and he's not going to know what to do you don't know what, people make questions some of the decisions he makes say well why would he do that why would he why would he light the lighter and there's an explanation for that but that's not even the real thing if you're in a box it's complete it's pitch black I'm lighting that lighter I don't care if it uses oxygen or not I'm going to be absolutely terrified to sit in complete darkness in I don't know 100 degrees and just sit there no way I at least want to be able to see something I was thinking the same thing when you get your mysterious visitor. Mm -hmm. Like I put, almost played the whole scenario out in my mind before it happened, and I pictured the tool I would grab to get rid of it. And he does something completely different. What would you have done? Grab the knife. The knife. Yeah. yeah. That. Yeah. Sure. I don't know, but I mean that's the thing. It's like that's what I wanted it to be for him. I didn't want all of the answers to be there. Yeah. You know, and that's now that you say that, I never, I never thought of the knife. 
No, I liked his idea better. After I saw well, it play out, I'm like, <laughs> I wish I would have thought like he did. Well, that worked out well, but that's what he thought of. And again, people might say, I don't know. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't. I don't. Would, I would, like you said, grabbing the knife would have been easier. But maybe the knife wasn't reachable at that moment. Maybe the snake was too close to it. I don't know. So when you cast Ryan, well, I guess uh, Rodrigo was in charge of that. Is that mm-hmm. something that you is he a guy you pictured? Did you have anyone else in mind while you were writing it? You know, this is this is the thing. I, I would love to say that I always had Ryan Reynolds in mind when I wrote this character, but you know, I could get you know bullshit called on me really quick if if someone just looked at the description of Paul Conroy which was originally, actually, I think 47 years old, physically unremarkable, and the embodiment of the everyman. So it doesn't really sound like Ryan physically, so again, it, it's, I didn't, in, but I didn't have anyone in particular. Someone asked me yesterday, you know, but who, like if you could, if, because I'm writing this at a point in my career where I, I don't even know what's gonna happen with this. I thought it was gonna be a $5,000 film. I just wanted it to be made. I wanted, it, it just mattered to have an actor that was outstanding and that could carry this role on their shoulders and that they could uh, allow the audience to identify with them. So once I knew it was Ryan, it was instantly Ryan's Paul Conroy because Ryan has that sense of every man about him. Ryan has that identifiable quality that we can say, I'm going to root for this guy. And, I, and I, can, I can empathize with him. He's not someone whose routine becomes cloying after a while or, or anything else. He's a very real guy. He's a very genuine human being. And... And so it didn't, again, it didn't matter. I didn't envision anyone specifically. But once I knew who it was, yes, Ryan, per, Ryan is Paul Conroy. And then after I saw him be Paul Conroy, there's no question he's Paul Conroy. Did you get to talk to him before he actually went on set? Like, talk it out at all? No, Rodrigo did. Rodrigo did. Rod, I remember him, Rodrigo, calling me and saying, uh, I'm meeting with Ryan Reynolds, and, and both of us were like, he would be perfect. He would be perfect. Just because, you know, Rodrigo in particular, I think, was drawn to Ryan's sense of timing. And I can see why, because having had an acting background myself, I always felt things like comedy and even just say just being happy were the tougher things to do. And Ryan, obviously, that's what he was known for mostly at that point, was this, you know, the sense of timing, this, this comedic timing and everything else. And if you can do that, I really feel you can do the other stuff extremely well. And then I saw... Um, I obviously, at the, I think at that point already, I'd, I'd, had seen, I'd seen the Nines and a couple of other Ryan, of Ryan's films where he was more of a dramatic actor. And his range is, is, is phenomenal. And I think with this film, it really, really shows that. Yeah, he, the comedic timing thing comes through a number a number of times. Yeah, that, it does. You know, could have either taken us out, given us a little chuckle. Like, every time he cracked a joke, I kind of felt like, like I'd laugh. But then when I'd stop laughing, it'd make me second think it and, mm-hmm. I don't know, turn it into, like, a darker comedy because he's still trapped no matter yeah. how funny he is. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. These are just brief, brief moments of levity, if that. There, it's just, it's kind of that gallows humor, really. It, it's You just, you're laughing. It's almost like a, fuck, yeah. You know, you can't help but just go, oh, my God. This is just getting worse and worse for this guy. So for your next film, ATM, mm-hmm. you're kind of like doing a very similar thing. I mean, I, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but we've got people trapped in a little ATM yeah. area. Can I've heard a little about it, but can you tell me about it in your own words? Yeah, that is a horror thriller, actually. And uh, ATM is about about three characters, three co-workers, which I felt was a pretty interesting dynamic. Not to pat myself on the back, I just mean in general. The concept of co-workers as opposed to friends, because it, it becomes the question of, as they, as as you know, they encounter this this perilous situation. How how well do you really know people? And it's not a question of who can I trust necessarily, as much as it's a question of how much am I willing to put on the line. This isn't necessarily my best best friend in the world. This is someone I work with and I become friends with at work. So anyway, so that's that's the dynamic of these main characters, and and it really is a very very simple setup, which is three people go out to work. I'm sorry, after work after their Christmas party, they go out. They're driving home. One of them's drunk wants to go eat so the place he wants to go eat is this late night pizza joint that doesn't take cards like a lot of those places don't so they have to stop and get cash and they just pull off and they find themselves in this really desolate supermarket parking lot with one of these you know standalone vestibule atms and they just go in there and it's absolutely freezing out they're in the midwest i think and um and as they're leaving they just see this guy there and and naturally, they don't know what the hell he wants. It's like two in the morning. It's, at, it's like five below zero, and there's this guy with this big jacket on. And, and as we soon learn, his intentions are pretty bad. I, I don't want to spoil anything, but 
like I'm picturing kind of like I don't know like like Michael Myers or Jason standing out there with I don't know like a machete or something very no it's visual. not that, it it's more on the psychological level this film as well and that's what it has in common with Barry too is that it's it's kind of that what well, again what would I do how would I get out of this awful situation and he's not a Michael Myers character uh, he's not a Jason he's not an unstoppable force uh, you know we find out he's just you know we find out who he is he's you know. I don't know. Actually, you don't. We don't really kind of find. Out. I don't know. He's just you do and you don't. I don't know. He, but he's not this this unstoppable um, killer that you could shoot a hundred times and he just gets right back up. He's a human being, and uh, and in the case of that film, how it kind of came about is that with Peter Safran, the producer, and buried when we were in Barcelona. I mean, this this was such a huge, huge thing for me. This was like my breakthrough thing. So I'm over there in Barcelona all of a sudden watching my film be shot, buried, and. And so we're sitting there, and he just, <laughs> we're at lunch, and he's like, so, what other can contain thriller ideas do you have? And I was like, well, I have another one. So if you have a producer that's already made one of your films, and you tell him about this other idea you also had, and he says, oh, good, I want to make that one too, you're going to go out and write it. And that's what I did.